It's just past 7.30 p.m. across India, live from New Delhi. You're watching DD India Global. We'll get you top stories from India and the region. I am Tanvi Taneja. And for news from the rest of the world, I'm joined by my colleague in Washington, D.C., Nick Harper. Nick, good to have you with us. Good morning, Tanvi. It's 10 a.m. here in Washington, D.C. It's 3 in the afternoon across Central Europe. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, the U.S. Congress considers funding for Ukraine and Israel, and the search continues for impartial jurors for Donald Trump's hush money trial. But first, the headlines. Russian President Vladimir Putin urges all sides in the Middle East to show reasonable restraint. Iranian President tells his Russian counterpart that Tehran is not interested in escalating the conflict. U.S. to use sanctions to disrupt Iran's malign and destabilizing activity in the Middle East, says Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Hunt for potential jurors on as day two of Donald Trump's historic hush money trial begins in New York. And UK to criminalize creation of sexually ex explicit deep fake images, accused to face criminal record and unlimited fine. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Tuesday urged all sides in the Middle East to refrain from action that would trigger a new confrontation with catastrophic consequences for the region. Putin spoke to Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and said that Palestinian-Israeli conflict needs to be solved. Iran launched drones and missiles at Israel late on Saturday in retaliation for an Israeli strike on its Damascus consulate on April 1st. Meanwhile, Israeli war cabinet is due to meet on Tuesday to discuss the response to Iran's attack on its territory over the weekend. This will be the third time that the decision-making cabinet convenes since Iran launched over 300 missiles and drones against Israel on Saturday. The meeting comes as Israel has vowed to respond to Iran's attack, with its military chief of staff saying that the attacks would not go unanswered. I want to thank all our international partners who stood up to Iran's aggression. Iran's attack has created new opportunities for cooperation in the Middle East. We are closely assessing the situation. We remain at our highest level of readiness. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. We will choose our response accordingly. Now, Iran, on the other hand, said that any action against its interest will be responded to. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Iranian Foreign Minister warned on Tuesday that their nation will respond to any retaliatory strikes and the smallest action against its interests will be met with a severe and widespread response against any perpetrator. If the Israeli regime makes a mistake, this time Iran's response, as Iran's military commanders announced, will not be minimal, but immediate and severe. Now, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock is heading to Israel later today for discussions to prevent an escalation of tensions in the region following Iran's attack over the weekend. Addressing the news conference with her Jordanian counterpart, the German Foreign Minister said it is important to stop Iran without provoking further escalation. I will make another trip to Israel today to assure our Israeli partners Germany's full solidarity and we will talk about how a further escalation with more and more violence can be prevented. It's decisive now to stop Iran without provoking further escalation. It's incredibly important for us as the German federal government in these fragile times 
that we all work together to contribute to de-escalation for the entire region. Now, amid all this, the United States is preparing for fresh sanctions for Iran. This is what Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said after Iran's attack on Israel last weekend threatened stability in the Middle East and led to potential economic spillovers. Yellen was addressing a news conference on an unprecedented attack on Israel by Iran and its proxies, saying the U.S. Treasury would use its sanctions authority and work with allies to continue disrupting the Iranian regime's malign and destabilizing activity in the region. The U.S. is using financial sanctions to isolate Iran and disrupt its ability to fund proxy groups and also support Russia's conflict with Ukraine. Now, the U.S. House of Representatives prepares to vote on four separate measures providing aid to Israel and Ukraine. My colleague Nick Harper is in Washington, D.C. He takes it forward from me here and gives us more on this and other stories making headlines around the world. Nick, crucial legislation is expected today? That's right, Tamvi. U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson has said spending legislation will be released later on Tuesday with lawmakers still fine-tuning the final figures. The House is gearing up for a vote on four separate measures, providing aid to Israel and Ukraine, along with assistance to Taiwan and U.S. allies in the Indo-Pacific region. These measures could hit the House floor as early as Friday for a vote. Johnson also mentioned that the fourth bill, focusing on national security priorities, will include additional sanctions on Russia and Iran. We will vote on the Israel aid, uh, on the uh, aid to Ukraine, on the aid to the Indo-Pacific, and then another measure that has our national security priorities uh, included, and that has some of the things with regard to the uh, loan lease uh, option and the, uh, the Repo Act and, and some other sanctions on Iran and, and other measures that we've been talking about here for quite some time. Donald Trump has reached the New York courthouse for the second day of his historic hush money trial as lawyers try to select 12 jurors to consider the former U.S. president's guilt or innocence. Over half of the 96 potential jurors that were questioned on Monday were dismissed after saying they could not impartially judge the accused. The Manhattan District Attorney has charged Trump with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to cover up a hush money payment he allegedly made to an adult star before the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies that the affair took place. Well, to get more on this, DD India's William Denslow is joining us live from New York. Uh, William, it seems like a tough task to try and find jurors for this case. Exactly how are they trying to find the 12 impartial men and women for this trial? Nick, as you rightly mentioned, an incredibly difficult task. And we got a sense of that on Monday with Judge Juan Machan warning at the end of day one of jury selection that they were already running behind schedule, asking jurors to start each day promptly. That has not been the case. Several jurors were running behind schedule, further delaying the start of proceedings uh, here in Lower Manhattan at the courthouse. You can see behind me. Finding impartial jurors that are both um, amenable to both the defence and prosecution, well, that could prove very difficult indeed. You mentioned those 96 initial pool of jurors on Monday, over half of them putting their hands up, saying they honestly couldn't be impartial, whether that's in favour of the former president or if they're uh, strong critics of him. So whittling down a jury pool to someone that, of course, is such a well-known figure across the United States will be incredibly tricky. Adding to the complications, Donald Trump himself has tried to move this trial outside of Lower Manhattan, arguing that this is a strong bastion of Democratic support and it will be very hard, he argues, to find fair jurors in this part of the city. And Donald Trump has also been speaking again this morning before he entered the courtroom. He didn't seem particularly happy. What did he have to say? 
think that's absolutely right. We heard what we could expect to be a strong line from his, from himself and from his defence team throughout this trial. When entering the courthouse, he really laid out his arguments. It all revolves around this payment of 130 thousand dollars that was provided uh, by his then fixer now star witness for the prosecution Michael Cohen now it's alleged by the prosecution that that one hundred and thirty thousand dollars was a hush money payment to the porn star Stormy Daniels Donald Trump has said that this was a legal expense to Michael Cohen nothing nefarious nothing more than that so he rejects the premise that is why he has pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges also interestingly on social media he's again called called for a gag order uh, to be released and prosecutors here in Lower Manhattan this morning have reminded Donald Trump that violations of that gag order could result in fines or up to 30 days in prison. They say that just in the past 10 days or so he's already been violating that gag order. William, thank you. That was William Denslow joining us live from New York City. Well, staying with U.S. news and the FBI is opening a criminal investigation after a huge container ship lost power and crashed into a major bridge in the U.S. city of Baltimore, killing six people at the end of last month. The investigation is aimed at determining if the cargo boat's crew left the port aware that the vessel had systematic problems before the deadly collision, which caused the Francis Key Bridge to collapse. Nearly two dozen Indian sailors are still stuck on board. As Didi India's Benji Higher reports. The latest from the scene of that fatal crash was that FBI agents have embarked on the Dali just upstream from where I'm standing on the edge of the shipping channel in and out of Baltimore. They are there, they say, to conduct court authorized law enforcement activity. They want to try to assess whether the crew who were still on board knew of any issues with the ship before it set sail. A 22-man crew, all but whom, all but one of whom, I should say, are Indian citizens. Uh, it should be mentioned that uh, the US Coast Guard did undertake a safety check of the vessel back in 2023. No deficiencies were found at the time. And this FBI probe is not the only ongoing investigation. The National Transportation Safety Board has one already underway to look into the cause of the disaster. There is going to be a prelim preliminary report expected in the coming weeks, but a full report might not be published for another two years. In the meantime, President Joe Biden is promising to use federal funds to build, uh, rebuild the Key Bridge, reconstruct it, a, a major crossing uh, in the US city of Baltimore. But whilst the clearing of debris takes place and whilst there are plans to rebuild, at the same time, we're hearing from many different experts who are concerned that other bridges in the same vicinity could be vulnerable if there were to be a collision of this magnitude again. Benji Haya in Maryland reporting for DD India. On to the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict now, and Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has signed into law a bill that overhauls army mobilization rules. The law will be enforced one month following its official publication. The law mandates that men should update their draft data with the authorities. It increases payments for volunteers, and it introduces new penalties for draft evasion. During his three-day trip to China, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz held talks with President Xi Jinping in Beijing on Tuesday. They deliberated on enhancing economic cooperation between the largest economies of Asia and Europe, with Scholz advocating for improved market access and fair competition for German companies. Scholz has urged Chinese President Xi to use his influence in helping resolve the conflict in Ukraine and emphasising their joint stance against attacks on nuclear installations. To the UK now, where the government has announced that it will criminalise the creation of sexually explicit deepfake images. As per the new guidelines, anyone found guilty of creating fake sexual images of people without their consent will face a criminal record, an unlimited fine and perhaps even jail time if the image is widely shared. The new offence will be introduced through an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill. DD India's Ollie Barrett sent us this report from London. 
the new criminal offence will be brought in as an amendment to the government's criminal justice bill, which is already making its way through Parliament. Under that legislation, it will then become a criminal offence with potentially unlimited fines for anyone who fabricates explicit images of an adult without their consent. If such an image goes viral or is widely shared, that could lead to jail for the creator. Deepfakes see pictures or video altered digitally, often with artificial intelligence technology, so that one person's face replaces that of another, so it appears that they are in an explicit image. The offence will apply even if the person who made the deepfake didn't intend to share it, but did mean to cause alarm, humiliation or distress to the victim. The Minister for Victims and Safeguarding in the UK, Laura Farris, says that deepfakes are an example of ways in which certain people seek to degrade and dehumanise others, especially, she says, women. Ollie Barrett in London, reporting for DD India. Well, that's it from me here in Washington. Tanvi, handing it back to you in the studio. Thank you very much, Nick. Nick Harper joining us all from Washington, D.C. You're watching DD India Global, still to come on the show. Heavy rains lash UAE and surrounding nations, causing flooding and traffic disruptions in Dubai. And the torch for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games lit in ancient Olympia. आपको रिफंड सही सलामत अब यह कहता है की जानकार बनिए सतर्क रहिए Welcome back. You're watching DD India Global. I'm Tanvi Taneja. Now we get you all the buzz related to India's elections. So different political parties are busy finalizing their candidates for the upcoming elections. The Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, has released a list of seven Lok Sabha candidates for Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Maharashtra and West Bengal. In its latest list, Abhijit Das has been fielded in West Bengal's Diamond Harbour constituency against TMC's Abhishek Banerjee. Urdhyan Raj Bhosle in Maharashtra, Satara, Anita Somprakash from Hoshiarpur, Parampur Kaur Siddhu from Bhatinda have been named among others. From Uttar Pradesh, Shashank Mani Tripathi will take up the fight in Devariya and Thakur Vishwadeep Singh will contest from Firozabad. The BJP has also announced candidates for Odisha Assembly polls and Telangana and Uttar Pradesh Assembly by polls. So campaigning for the first phase of Lok Sabha elections is in top gear now as the leaders of various political parties are campaigning across different states to woo the voters. Prime Minister and senior BJP leader Narendra Modi addressed two public meetings in Bihar's Gaya and Purnia today. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that Congress and its allies are trying to use constitution as a weapon for their political benefit. Addressing a public meeting in Gaya in Bihar this morning, Prime Minister Modi said that a false narrative is being created by opposition parties to mislead people that the BJP will change the constitution. Criticizing RJD's time in power, senior BJP leader said that RJD is the face of jungle, Raj and corruption. The Prime Minister said that the people of the country have decided that the BJP should cross 400 seats because the people want to see India developed by 2047.
So leaders are leaving no stone unturned as the poll date for the first phase approaches. India's Home Minister and Senior Party Leader Amit Shah held a public rally in Jammu and Uttarakhand today. Union Minister and Senior BJP Leader Anurag Singh Thakur held a public rally in Kishtavar to seek votes for party candidate Dr. Jitendra Singh, who is contesting from Udhampur Kathua Doda Lok Sabha seat. Congress MP Rahul Gandhi also held a roadshow today in Malapuram, Kerala. Congress General Secretary Priyanka Gandhi Vadra participated in roadshows in Assam and Tripura organized in support of the Indi Alliance candidates. While Samajwadi Party candidate from Mainpuri constituency, Dimple Yadav, filed her nomination on Tuesday. Now, one of India's northeastern states, Sikkim, is going to polls on the 19th of April for its lone parliamentary seat and 32 assembly seats. Fierce campaigning is on by all political parties fighting it out over a range of promises and issues. One of the issues is the practice of 100% organic farming. Sikkim is the only state in India which was declared fully organic in 2016 by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. But sustaining the practice seems to have had its own challenges. Gotham Roy reports from Gangkok. Gangtok. Organic and inorganic produce being bought and sold in Gangtok's Lal Bazar, a shopping hub in Sikkim's capital. Sikkim went into 100% organic farming after 12 years of efforts. Prime Minister Narendra Modi declared the state fully organic during a visit to it in 2016. But since then, keeping it going seems to have become a challenging affair. We are in Gangtok's iconic landmark Lal Bazar, where organic produce from within Sikkim and inorganic produce from outside are both sold. And the shopkeepers who deal here with organic produce have a list of complaints that range from price competitiveness with the inorganic produce from outside as well as transport. There are problems with transport. The roads are bad, vehicles have to take longer routes, transport charge doubles. We have increased rates somewhat. People say it's become too expensive. Sales are a bit low these days. A lot of cheaper, inorganic vegetables come from outside. Smart Mart has also opened a lot. Even online shopping has affected us. Going fully organic was the initiative of the previous Sikkim Democratic Front government in the state, which is now in opposition. The SDF alleges that the ruling Sikkim Krantikari Mocha government is not promoting organic processes with as much sincerity. But representatives of the ruling SKM rubbish the opposition's charges. It's a wrong propaganda that the opposition is doing. Those who are doing farming, we are giving them incentives. You see a manifesto this year. We are promoting organic farming. Organic farming and organic produce is Sikkim's USP. It's what brings this land global recognition, even India is put on the map. Clearly, it needs to be nurtured further to ensure that it brings maximum benefit to all the stakeholders who are involved in it. With Converse and Sumit Dhiman, this is Gautam Roy in Gangtok for DD India. So from India's northeast to its north, election fever mounts in Uttarakhand's Masuri that will also go to polls on 19th April. DD India's Siddharth Bhardwaj has more. It's Lok Sabha polls 2024 and the excitement is certainly in the air. Well, I'm in Masuri, also called the Queen of Hills. And people this time around here in the region have certain hopes and aspirations. Amidst the breathtaking vistas of Masuri, a different kind of hustle and bustle is underway, the looks of our elections. The picturesque hill station is not just a tourist hotspot, but also a crucial political background. As political parties vie for votes, the beauty of Masuri serves as a striking backdrop to the democratic process. But beyond its serene landscapes, locals are vocal about pressing issues like road, infrastructure and health care. We are expecting that the government will bring out policies which are friendly for the tourist plus friendly for the localites in the uh, town. Primarily what we are looking at is uh, employment and we are looking at tourism generation and road infrastructure. But we are pretty happy with the connectivity that's happening. More should be done and we hope more coming up in the times to come. Despite these challenges, tourists continue to flock to Masuri, drawn by its natural beauty and vibrant culture. 
For them, the elections add an extra layer of intrigue to their holiday experience. With the election fervor in full swing, Masuri remains a beacon of democracy against the backdrop of its stunning landscape. Well, the state of Uttarakhand will go to polls on April 19 in single phase. And the residents here hope that the elected representatives will not only preserve the charm of this region, but also will cater to the basic needs of the people here. With camera person Manmohan, this is Siddharth Bharadwaj reporting for DD India. You're watching DD India Global. Now let's get you up to speed with what else is happening around the world. The European Union has decided to allocate $3.71 billion towards safeguarding the ocean and advancing sustainability through various initiatives this year. EU's top environment official announced a list of 40 commitments to protect the oceans on Tuesday. This includes combating marine pollution, backing sustainable fisheries and fostering investments in the blue economy. About 990 homes and residential plots in Russia's Kurgan region near the Tobol River and Kazakhstan border are submerged in flood water due to rapidly rising water levels. In the Orenburg region, approximately 30 kilometers of protective dams have been constructed with thousands of personnel engaged in rescue operations. Parts of the UAE faced heavy rain on Tuesday, causing flooding and traffic disruptions in Dubai. Earlier on Monday, Dubai police issued a public safety advisory warning residents of adverse weather conditions. In Oman, flash floods claimed at least 17 lives between April 14th and 15th. And the torch for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games was lit in ancient Olympia in a traditional ceremony on Tuesday, marking the final stretch of the seven-year preparations for the Games' official start on July 26th. Paris will host the Summer Olympics for a third time after 1900 and 1924. <laughs> And as we wind up this edition of DD India Global, let's head for some lunar exploration with the robot Spirit that has been designed uh, for undergoing uh, lunar exploration trials in the challenging terrain of Mount Hood in Oregon, United States. With a $2 million grant over two years, the project seeks to assist NASA in deploying teams of robots for lunar exploration. So that's all for this edition of DD India Global. Do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter and Instagram at DD India Live. You can also find us online at ddindia.co.in. We will be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Tanvi Taneja from my entire team in New Delhi. Thank you for watching. Namaskar.